So good afternoon and welcome back to another live iThemes training event. We're so glad you're with us today and we have with us a very special guest today, Rebecca Gill, who is the founder of Web Savvy Marketing. Rebecca is an expert in all things SEO and has been bringing uh, incredibly useful information to us here at iThemes Training over uh, the past, uh, well, it's been over a year now. Every month, Rebecca has been giving us excellent content here concerning SEO. So we are thrilled to have Rebecca back with us today as we talk about SEO-friendly website architecture. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me again. Great. So uh, where do we start here? What do we need to know about building, uh, building our website SEO-friendly from the beginning? So let me paint a picture for you. I receive a new website client or maybe it's an SEO client and I get access into their WordPress dashboard or it could be any actually CMS system. I log into the system, I go into their pages or their posts and I see this huge list of just content and I am overwhelmed and I don't know where to start. The reason that I don't know where to start is because they've thrown everything in without any logic and it's all very flat and haphazardly placed based on time, based on, you know, whatever drafts they have, et cetera. <clears throat> and if I'm overwhelmed, can you imagine what the search engines feel like when they are trying to crawl through that website or blog and kind of figure out the content, what's it about, you know, where is it laid out, what kind of topics it has. That's the issue at hand, is really being able to create a, a website architecture or a structure that is easy to digest and understand, both for a user, an administrator, and then as well as the search engines. And that's what we're talking about today. It's nothing that is scary or crazy or code heavy. It's just trying to create some logic to your website and how you set it up so that the search engines can digest what you have, understand your content, and best present it into search. And this works both for you, it works for the, the people that are, the humans that are actually coming to your site or your blog, and then it's really important for the search engines. So that's our goal today, and that's what we're gonna walk through. That's gonna be excellent content, and as Rebecca gets ready to dive into her information here, let me just encourage everyone, uh, if as you have questions, feel free to drop those in the chat room. Make sure it, it'll help me to capture those uh, if you type question or something like that in all caps. Uh, that way I'll make sure to uh, grab your question and save it. We'll take time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers, and uh, we usually have plenty of time for that. So uh, make sure you drop your questions there in the live chat room at ithemes.com forward slash chat. We don't use the questions feature and go to webinar, but instead that live chat room at ithemes.com forward slash chat. So uh, drop your questions there and we look forward to a great webinar. Uh, Rebecca, as you may have noticed, is just a little bit under the weather today. So we are good thoughts toward her uh, as she's getting ready to jump in here. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've been sick for three weeks and I'm just struggling getting over it. And I am coughing a little bit. And if I cough and annoy you today, I to apologize. Just know that if I'm annoying you, can you imagine how much I've annoyed my family for three weeks of sickness? And yes, I have annoyed them um, significantly. So I will, I'll try to keep that to a minimum. So let's talk about what we're going to um, review and what you should really consider when you're looking at your website architecture. <coughs> First and foremost is content silos. And we'll dig into those today and explain what they are and why they matter. Next, we're going to look at content depth which is how deep your content can be within those silos. Um, third is internal linking, which is literally the most underused SEO tool on the planet. People ignore it, and yet it is such a powerful, powerful tool in your, uh, your, your box of weapons for SEO. Um, the fourth item is duplicate content because it can really screw up your efforts on your website or blog. And then the last one is categories and tags. And this is because it is a personal pet peeve of mine um, of how misused these are. And uh, they, they can really be an asset for you with SEO, but they're just kind of thrown into sites at the last minute and they're, they're just an oversight with people. So I, I just want to touch on those just to make sure that um, you're aware of some best practices that you need to be aware of. <laughs> okay, so why should you care about website architecture? One reason is because when you have a good website architecture set up, 
it helps the search engines crawl and index your content. So crawling meaning weaving through and discovering what's available within your website or blog and figuring out what's there and digesting it. And then once they can digest it, they can place it within their index so it can show up for search. That's important. If the search engines can't crawl, they can't index and you can't appear in search, which means you're lacking traffic coming from organic search. And we don't want that. We want you to excel. So the next thing about the website architecture and why it's important is because it is a signal to the search engines about your content. It helps give them information and guidance on what they should do and how they should use it. <coughs> so we really want to take that into account and know that you're not just doing this for data, you're doing it to really help them understand the who and what of you. And then the third reason is it helps the humans that come visit your site. It helps them digest the information and find things and understand what content you have and where it's located. And that's the whole purpose of, you know, the internet is to provide data and provide useful information to people to, to help them solve their problems. And website architecture that's done right will help make this happen. All right, so let's dig into the first item, which is content silos. I love content silos. I learned about content silos, um, gosh, over a decade ago, and it was really probably by chance that I fell into it because back then there wasn't anything that said, hey, you need to use content silos, and here's what it is. Um, it was just kind of trying to model the competition that I had and seeing what they were doing, and then all of a sudden I realized, holy crap, these are powerful, and they're awesome, and I can really make use of these. So let's, let's dig in and figure out what they are and why you should have them on your website or blog. So a content silo, or it's also called an SEO silo, is just a method of grouping related content together to organize content or uh, information and to establish or the website's keyword-based themes or topics. So basically, you are taking your existing content or your planned content and you're organizing it in a manner so that it has some purpose or some groups. And that you're, you're probably thinking, oh, I don't know what that means, but I'm going to give you an example and it's going to make sense in just one second. But that's the official definition. So I call it a content silo. Other people sometimes call it an SEO silo. They're the same thing. <clears throat> okay, so think back to when you last visited a library. I mean a physical library where you walked through the door and you checked out a book. This is well before Kindles or iPads. When you went into the library, how did the staff help you find books of interest? How did they, they, they help you direct you to what you were looking for? What they did was they grouped content into sections like fiction or nonfiction or romance or westerns what they were doing is they were creating an old-fashioned content silo for you they were just giving you and grouping those books into those sections the bookstore the traditional old school bookstores do the same thing um you know for us in the states at least in michigan I, there's like one barnes and noble that's now available and everyone else is gone um, but they still have those content silos within the bookstores you have children adult fiction nonfiction, psychology business those are, those are silos of information, silos of content. And, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're just doing it in a digital format on the web. Remember that you're doing this not just for the search engines, but it's both for SEO and usability. And I, I emphasize that because as you think through what your potential silos are, you need to remember this and make sure that, <coughs> excuse me, that they're gonna help your user. They should also help you when you're organizing your content too. So here's a great example of a content silo. If you go to Barnes and Noble <coughs> and you hover on their books in the main navigation, it gives you like a mega menu that drops down and I have a picture of it up right now. So that mega menu is basically creating silos. So they've got like the customer favorites and the departments, but look at the subjects right in the middle. Same type of philosophy as that library. It's bucketing up information so that you think that they're using it solely for the user and it's so the user can find information. They're also doing it though for the search engine so the search engines can digest all of these books that they have available. <coughs> so what kind of subject matter should they have? Just like the ones I talked about um, in the old fashioned library, health and fitness, mystery and crime, romance, self-help, thrillers, sports and Westerns. You're just basically putting all of their books into sections or topic areas so that they're easily found and sorted through. So now let's take that one step further. Let's look at the silo breakdowns. 
<laughs> so if we were just to look at auditing, which is a, um, I think it's a grandchild, let's look at this URL. And you can go to the Barnes & Noble website if you want and look this up. So they have um, barnesandnoble.com slash B, which I assume is books, um, or I don't know, browsing, I guess. And then you've got books, accounting, and auditing. And whenever you see these slashes, that is creating a layer. And, and WordPress does this for you automatically when you do the child parent relationships. So let's look how this looks as if I were to put it in PowerPoint. Um, I've got art and underneath art, I have design, history, technique. I've got business, which its children are accounting, human resources, sales and marketing, and small business, fiction, thrillers, war and military, women's fiction, and so on and so on. Those make sense. And then if I look further underneath business, and all of these have the same the same breakdown, I go even lower into accounting. Now I get into auditing, bookkeeping, and taxation. And those are those would be grandchildren within this this um, <clears throat> hierarchy. This hierarchy, these are creating silos. So this is a business silo. It's a silo of business books. This is a silo of fiction books. And underneath auditing in this, this URL structure, you're going to see all the auditing books. What this is doing is you're, as you're creating these um, segmentations, you're allowing, again, the user to be able to filter through all the auditing books as well as the search engines to understand that there are all of these books underneath auditing. But there's something else that's really powerful going on. As you fill up all of these little children pages, and grandchildren and great grandchildren, and you put the books underneath them, it builds up these silos. So, accounting, once accounting has, um, you know, say 10 uh, children underneath it, and then there's books like 100 books under auditing, 100 books under bookkeeping, and 100 books under taxation, this guy becomes more powerful. Accounting books becomes more powerful in the eyes of the search engines because the search engines see that this is a huge this isn't just one page this is a topic area or a a group of content and it gives from an seo standpoint accounting more weight that in turn gives business books more weight because the search engines see this big fat silo of, of information and all of this data underneath it and it thinks wow well if business has a thousand books underneath it and this is all <clears throat> nicely laid out there, there's some meat to this. So it wants to rank the business books page higher than other content because it sees all of these children and grandchildren and great grandchildren available to it and knows that this is a powerful piece of information on the website. That's what you're doing with content silos. You're not only structuring the content so the search engines and the users can find it, but you're giving weight to all of these parent pages so that they look more powerful and they they actually become more, um, more important to the search engines. And then in turn, the search engines really want to rank those. <clears throat> so while most people are going to assume that Barnes & Noble or any other Amazon are doing this all for the ease of the users, again, they're also doing it for the search engines. They're making sure that their structure is helping the search engines digest and index and crawl and really rank their content well. And, and you can use the same philosophy for you and any size website. <coughs> Organization is the key to this entire process. Content silos help search engines because just like the human visitor, search engines need to have a good understanding of your website's content. Uh, who remembers this picture that I have up here in black and white and she looks like she's from the 70s based on her hair and her outfit? of the old fashioned library. Okay, so in college, I went through, I put myself through college, um, all self-funded, and as part of that, as part of my grants and my, my student loans, I actually had a work-study program for a year. My work-study program was working at the college library, and I literally did those index cards, and I literally took the books and, and put them back on the shelves at the, at, at the library. I cannot tell you how mind-numbing that job was. It was so boring and put wanted to put you to sleep, but it had purpose, right? It was so important because if I didn't do that job, students couldn't find the books that they needed. I had to actually be able to go through that process as mind-numbing as it was, sort through and create that organization structure that the librarian had put in place so that people could filter through tons and tons of books, tons and tons of content, and find what they were looking for. 
Now take my large college library and, and multiply that endless amounts of time into the internet. That's the whole process. You know, the internet has so much information. It's, I thought when I was in college that the library was overwhelming with its multiple layers, multiple levels of books and, and, and elevators to get to the different floors because they all had different books and different topics. Can you imagine what the search engines must view the internet with all the information? That's why these content silos are important is because you are help creating that, that card index structure but for your website and you really help standing yourself out or your, that of your clients, you know, from everybody else, because no, very few people actually put into place really solid content silos. And if they do, they're haphazard and they're not really done with purpose and with SEO in mind. So if you actually take this pro this time and you take the process to organize your content and you put it into these good, well-structured content silos, you are doing yourself a favor. You're doing your clients a favor because you are really helping search engines and users understand what you have and get to that information quickly. Okay, so relevance is a, a phrase with SEO that's becoming more and more important. Keyword relevance or the level of importance is based on one page's content and how it relates to the rest of the website. <coughs> The more that you have content that um, you know is is relevant to that content around you and it actually really pertains to what you're talking about, the easier time it is to rank. And so let me just give you an example. On my web savvy site, I talk about WordPress, website design, and SEO. Those are really three big buckets that um, you know we have that we discuss. If I create a blog post and it's SEO focused, it's really easy for me to rank because Google knows that's who I am. I have content in, in, in buckets of content about SEO within both my pages and my blog. Do the same thing about WordPress. Again, pretty easy for me to rank because the search engines know that's who I am because it's got relevancy. Now, say I decide that I'm gonna become an affiliate for a pharmaceutical company and I wanna push Viagra. If I write a blog post about Viagra, it's like the odd man out. It's like that, um, the, the, the cartoon when we were little in the US and they would say which one doesn't belong and they gave you all these boxes. I, the Viagra doesn't belong. It doesn't fit with anything else. There's no relevance. I'm not going to rank on a blog post about Viagra on the Web Savvy site because it doesn't belong on the site and the search engines know it. There is no relevancy. So that, that's, that's the things that you're doing with this organization is you're helping provide that relevance and helping the search engines understand what is relevant based on what you're talking about and where it belongs. So it's easier for the search engines to find and deliver, again, relevant content when it's focused and organized, organized around topics. What are my topics? My topics are website design, WordPress, and SEO. It's really going to be based on whatever your website or your blog is. Your, if you're a food blogger, it, it might be paleo. It could be organic. There's, there's just so many ways to dice and slice information. And that's really, again, this relevancy and these topics, it's what we're really trying to create and do. So let's look at a few more examples. These are ones that I have in my SEO course and I've used in presentations before because I think that they're really easy to digest and understand. I don't do yoga. My sister-in-law owns a yoga studio, so this is why I have this one. So here's it. This, this guy right on the left is the yoga studio. I am creating three sets of silos. First one is studios. We're assuming that Christy owns multiple studios, and these are the cities, right? New York, Chicago, Dallas, and Orlando. Because they're all going to have their own location page, I want to have them in a silo that is underneath yoga studios. If I wanted to rank for yoga studios, that phrase, this would be the page that I would have and target for that. This page has more dominance because underneath it, I have New York yoga studio, Chicago yoga studio, Dallas yoga studio. Next, instructors. My keyword focus is yoga instructors. That would be for this parent page. Underneath it, Christy would be a yoga instructor. James might be a Pilates instructor. But the point is, is again, I'm creating those silos that those, um, Topical areas and relevance would be Christy to James. Next, classes. Now, until I, Christy married in my family, I had no idea what any of these were. But these are all types of yoga classes. And again, another silo. Now, let's switch gears. We're not going to do a web website. We're having a blog. We've got a blog. The blog is about Las Vegas. Here's Las Vegas restaurants, hotels, 
shows. The goal would be to rank for individual restaurants as well as the plural Las Vegas restaurants. The more guys and the more restaurants and, and children you have underneath here, the more dominance you give to this top level um, page of Las Vegas restaurants. Again, I'm serving two purposes here. I'm allowing the search engines to understand where my content is, how it's organized, and the relevancy of a given page to another page or post within it. Then I'm also providing value to the user because I'm allowing the user to say, okay, I see here's the main Las Vegas restaurant page. Let me find all these children underneath it. Let me browse through and see what's happening here. And it's serving both purposes. You're doing wonderful things for the search engines because they can crawl and index your content more easily and better understand it. And then you're also doing the exact same for the user. Let's look at the URL structures for those. Same content silos we have, and I just threw up a, a fake a URL. This could exist, I don't know. But again, studios with the slashes. Then I have underneath studios, I have the city of New York, Chicago, Dallas, Orlando. They all say, they all share, excuse me, the same parent. Same thing for classes. Vinyase, Pilates, um, hot yoga, all underneath the same parent of classes. You do this easily in WordPress by just creating that parent-child relationship. One thing to notice though is my parent is plural. And that is because the parent is plural. That parent page is plural. It is having and housing multiple individual items underneath it. So I have a Pilates class, but it's under yoga classes. Um, same thing for hotels and shows underneath the VegasBaby.com website. Again, just made it up. Could actually live, but it's purely made up in my mind. <clears throat> but again, plural for the parent, singular for the children. And I am just creating structure, organization to the content, but it greatly helps both the indexing of the site as well as the ranking of those individual pages. Okay, um, I hopefully that makes sense to everybody. If not, take a moment, throw in some questions so that we can hit them at the end of the presentation. I always leave at least 15 minutes for us to go through things. So that's the overview of content silos and I am happy to answer any questions that you have at the end. Um, so now let's talk about content depth because <coughs> this is where you get into trouble. <laughs> and you might think in trouble, so, you don't want to have a too flat a website where there is no structure and there's no parent-children relationship because that makes it really difficult for the search engines and users to find content as well as an, an admin. It's really hard for you to manage that content. But on the flip side of that, you don't want to create so many content silos that a page is so far down that it's very difficult to get to and to weave your way into from a navigation standpoint. So let's talk about content depth because that matters just as much. So content depth matters. You want to create those silos and the layers that will support SEO efforts and create a positive user experience because one doesn't mean anything without the other. You've got to have both, right? You've got to have that positive user experience offset with the content silo so that they're working in tandem and in harmony with each other. If you're, they're not in harmony with each other, then you've got a problem you need to revisit your plan. You want to create balance. So this next bullet point is create balance and you don't want to have 75% of your content sitting in one silo. So I gave you those examples earlier of the Vegas blog. And what, but what I mean by this is you wouldn't want to have 75% <coughs> of your blog or your um, content sitting underneath restaurants and then only, you know, three hotels underneath that silo or two hotels underneath shows. It, it looks really um, off center it becomes difficult for the user and then the search engines will look at it and go, okay, well this, this website or this blog is completely about restaurants and it's not about shows or hotels because there's nothing there. That's why you want to have some balance and have some equilibrium to um, the structure of your site. <coughs> this is a big one, this next one. You want to keep your layers limited. And by limited, I mean no more than three clicks from the homepage. <coughs> Excuse me. This is both for usability and crawlability. So, when you start putting things seven and 10 layers deep, which I've seen websites go up to like 14 with it, working on SEO projects with them and I inherit something, um, it's really hard for the search engines to crawl that 
and be able to index it, it's really hard for a user to get to it. So the rule of thumb I usually have is like no more than three clicks. So that means you have a parent, a child, and a grandchild, and then once you start to get past that, you start to get into sketchy land. Maybe you could have one more layer, but after that, I, I, I caution you, there shouldn't be a need to have that, that deep of information. You need to restructure what you're doing and make it more usable. Shorter URLs are better for users and crawlability. <coughs> so when you're doing your content and you're creating those silos and that architecture and that layout, keep that in mind, right? Don't create a parent that's four words long. It, it just becomes a really long URL structure, so you need to keep those short. The examples that I gave you with those URLs were classes. You know, they, they were short URLs, and keep that in mind as you're, you're building out your content. Okay, so I like to visualize my content, and I love to do this with DinoMapper. I've talked about DinoMapper before. <coughs> Let's look at this. I pulled this up from, because um, at one point I, I had DynoMapper go through WP Engine, and DynoMapper will show you where the levels live. What it's showing here is WP Engine has 2,300 pieces of content, four levels deep, 2,300, five levels deep, 1,700, six levels deep, and I cut it off after seven, and I don't know what they have after seven, but it's you're seeing that there's a lot of their content is really, really deep, and so. Um, and the thing I like about DynaMapper is you can see it in different ways, <laughs> and I have that back here, but let's flip over to the web and go look at DynaMapper. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try to make this big so everybody can see it. Bear with me one second. <coughs> Excuse me for coughing. This is a visual of the, of the WP Engine website. Remember I said you want to have some balance, and you see like this huge section right here smaller section which is support these are support tags over here um, this is news and updates this big guy resource archives and but the thing i like about this is if you've got a large blog or you're working with a client or even your old your own site that you've had for like seven years you can get a lot of stuff in there and you might forget what's there this is a great way to visualize that content you just put in your URL, it'll go and crawl the entire, your URL or someone else's URL, you can do this to your competition, but it will crawl the website and then it will visually bring this content up for you. And you can view it this way, or you can come in and view it, I got this, oh, it's style that I wanna see. The default looks more like a PowerPoint presentation, where like I was showing you, this is a parent page, these are children, parent page, children. Um, and so you can look at it this way, and. <laughs> WP Engine has quite a few. Look at how far it goes, <laughs> right? So it's just, it's a fun way of looking at data. But then you can also change it and go to folder. I like to look at folder too. <clears throat> because now I have all of these guys and, and girls, I guess I would say, and I can collapse them and, and make them smaller. Um, and it just really helps you digest the content and really dig into to the content that's available. The, the beautiful thing about this is I can export it I can say I want to download it, and it will actually send it to an uh, Excel spreadsheet for me, give me a list of the URLs, the page titles, the number of words per page, and so I can really start to sort these by URL and really get a good, good understanding of the site, which if you're doing a redesign, really important, and, and that's why I subscribe to the software because I use the software to help do 301 redirects for client websites when we're doing um, redesigns and we want to make sure that we preserve their URLs and that incoming traffic and that the SEO value. So if you've never used DynoMapper, uh, consider it if you're going to be working on uh, website architecture because it's a really wonderful tool for that. <coughs> okay, so let's go back to um, the presentation. Again, I apologize for my coughing. Okay, so I've talked about content silos. We've talked about content depth and what you need to be cautious about with content depth. Let's talk about internal linking because internal linking is important as well. And it really helps build up the structure and the understanding of your content for both users and the search engines. So internal links are simply one link that is pointing to another, or excuse me, yeah, a link for like one piece of content in your website that is pointing to another piece of content within the same URL structure. 
Um, it is, again, the most underused SEO tool, I believe, and I just no one ever does it, and they really should be doing it. And when I say internal links, I'm not just talking about the main navigation of the website, like your menu at the top. I'm talking about links within the content itself. Um, when you're creating these internal links, you're creating hierarchy for the page, and you're giving in signals to the search engines about what's powerful, you know, what, web, what pages or posts are most important. And you're spreading the the or boosting and spreading ranking um, for those destination pages as you link to them. And I'll talk about that a little more because that didn't come up very, very eloquently. Um, the the links are going to um, help the search engines understand your most important content by you just linking over to a piece of content. It also helps them discover new content and allows them to crawl, thus index, thus rank that content. It's all, they'll work together in harmony to really help present your website and to tell the search engines what pages are most important. And then the alt text, which is the, the text used for those links, helps the search engines understand what that destination page is about. All of that works together to really help the search engines learn about your website and understand it. So let's look at those just a little bit more why they're important. This is a statement from Google um, within the reports of the Google Search Council. If you don't have that that tool, you need to make sure that you do have that tool because um, you, it's just, just vital for you to really have a Search Engine Council account and utilize it within your efforts. So this is Google's comment. They give you a list of your most linked content inside your site. And so it's they, they say, the number of internal links pointing to a page is a signal to search engines about the relative importance of that page. If an important page does not appear in this list, they mean their list within Search Engine Council of your most linked content. So if, it's, if the important page doesn't appear in this list or is less important page has relatively large number of links, you should reconsider and review your internal linking structure. Here is an example, and it's what most people do. If I always link to my contact page, the search engines will assume your contact page is your most important page. Now, in reality, with search, it isn't your most important page. You're not using your contact page to bring people into the website via organic SEO. The other thing people do is they always point to their about page. Or if you're a lawyer, you always point to the page about you that talks about you, right? Your qualifications and whatever. It's just, it's, it's the natural thing to do you are giving signals to the search engines that those are the most important pages in your website. But really, a lot of times they're not. Your most important pages are your products or your services, right? Those core pages about what you do and how you can help people. Those are the most important pages. But guess what happens? People forget to link over to those. They totally forget that that's, that's what they have to link to both to get to the users to see what they offer, but also to give triggers and information and data points to the search engines to say, these are most, my most important pages. This is what I want you to pay attention to. So as a follow-up to do to this webinar, <coughs> if you're not already doing it, I would like you to go into your Google Search Console account. I would like you to pull up your linked content, and this is internal links, not links coming in from other places. And I want you to look to see what you have ranked. And then I want, or linked, to the, what is your most linked content? Then I want you to look at the words you're using for those links and to see if they most, if they truly represent that content and they are your targeted keywords because they should be. I think you'll be all surprised at how much you see and how much you've um, overlooked uh, the ability to link and to provide good signals to the search engines. Okay, here's my tips for internal linking. Links from your homepage are very important. So when you're considering what content to put on your homepage for links and where you should link, you should be linking to your core service pages or your most important um, product pages. Um, have structured process for your linking <coughs> to your cornerstone content. Something that the premium Yoast just rolled out was a check mark for your cornerstone content or your most valuable content. Yoast team, I love you because that is an awesome feature. Up until a couple of years ago, I never would have encouraged people to subscribe to Yoast Premium, but they've put so many great features in it lately. I, I, how do you not? This is a wonderful tool for you to use to help with your linking, your, your internal linking. 
The words you use are powerful. I tell my kids that, and it's the same thing with your website, that all text you're using when linking is valuable. Don't use click here or read, read more. Describe the link that you're going to. That's an indicator for the search engines it, and the user. It tells them what they're going to find at the end of that click. <clears throat> Remember, those words that you're using should be your keywords for that destination page because, again, you're reinforcing that information for users in the search engines. And then I give another shout out to the Yoast Premium plugin at the bottom here because it is a good tool that will really help you with internal linking. Okay, so this is from Google, this, this little diagram. <laughs> and Google uses this and they're getting started with SEO Guide. And basically what it's telling you is it's using this information. So um, it just basically says, with appropriate anchor text or alt text, users and search engines can easily understand the link um, pages content. So the Google bot, which is the little guy that crawls your website and, and figures out what you have, as well as the user, wants to understand that if this page, this page, and this page is all linking to this page up here, what is it? So if these guys are all calling the links baseball cards, baseball card, baseball card, what does that tell the user in the search engines? That this page up here is about baseball cards. When you look at it from this perspective, it seems like really common sense. But if you actually go back to your own website or your blog or that of your client, you're going to realize that most of the time you're not actually doing this. You're not using those keywords that you should be to represent that content in the links. And you're not making sure that you have enough links that are um, intermixed in the website or the blog to help people find that content and really understand what it's about. <coughs> okay, let's talk about duplicate content. This is another pet peeve of mine. How the heck does duplicate content matter or happen? So it's e-commerce filters, session IDs, pay-per-click pages. I go into a client's website that I've never had before, a client, and I pull it up and I see four versions of the same service page, and they're doing this because of pay-per-click and AdWords. The problem is, is they haven't done it right, and all of these pages are duplicated and they're available to the search engines. That's confusing to the search engines. And when they're sitting in your HTML sitemap, they're confusing to the visitor as well. Um, comment pagination is one. Printer-friendly pages. This is another one that drives me crazy. People throw in a plugin that creates printer-friendly pages, and what it's doing is creating duplicate content throughout the entire stinking website. Don't do that. Um, www versus non-www scraped content or stolen content. Distributed product distribution descriptions in e-commerce. So if you have an e-commerce site, you are repping somebody else's product. If all you've done is taken their product descriptions, which are usually short, and you've plopped it on your website, that is duplicate content. It provides no value to the user and it provides no value to the search engines. They will not rank you because there's no reason to rank you. They can go rank the manufacturer. And then syndicated content. Um, duplicate content happens, and it happens a lot, and most of the time it's done without anyone realizing that they're creating these issues. So how to fix it? Write unique content, and don't just copy your manufacturer's descriptions. And that just seems funny, but it, everybody does it, and they just don't realize that the, the um, ramifications of their actions. Stop reposting your content to multiple sites. That's great that you wrote a blog post, but don't immediately go post it to LinkedIn and to Facebook and to um, some medium and all these other places because then it's difficult for the search engines to know who really owns that content. What is the, the originating URL? Um, use the rel canonical uh, <coughs> indicator. 301 redirect duplicate content to the real content. If you have this situation, don't just whack the duplicates. Use good fashion, old fashioned 301 redirects to point back to the right content. Set pay-per-click pages to no index, no follow. Again, if you're using Yoast, you can easily do this on a page or post level right within that tool. Get rid of the printer-friendly um, plugin and set up printer-friendly via your, your CSS file. Check Google Search Console for meta issues because that <coughs> Google Search Console will give you duplicate warnings for meta titles, meta descriptions guess what those give you? Those give you examples of where you've got duplicate content. And every time I go in there, I'm like, whoa, where did we get all this duplicate content for this client? And I realize it's like the printer-friendly plugin that I didn't even know was there. 
or you know pay per clicks and when they have large, large websites it's hard to see that stuff right away but you can see those issues in Google Search Console they're giving you those issues for a reason because it's difficult for them to understand your website and they want you to fix them Dino Mapper you can see this when you export the content to Excel and sort it by meta title or you know page title then you're going to see all the duplicates take the time to do this and clean up your site and the search engines will reward you <coughs> all right let's talk about categories and tags so my rule of thumb and this came back from Matt um, cuts years ago was a blog post should have one category and it can have multiple tags but really you want one category and I know um, Yoast will allow you to have two and you can have like a primary category and some websites and some blogs, I can see where that's a value. But the majority of the time, you really only need to have one. You don't, and the, the point of the categories and the tags is for people to be able to find like content. But what users do is they start throwing in uh, multiple categories to blog posts, and then they, the categories don't mean anything because they don't allow you to really sort content through topical areas or relevance, and that's what they're trying to do. Um, categories and tags. <coughs> should only be used when you've got multiple articles that can be associated with them. So for example, I'll go into uh, uh, someone's website or blog and I'll just, it's spring. So they'll have a tag for spring, one for spring weather, one for spring time. And unfortunately, all of these tags are pretty much the same and they're all assigned to the same blog post and no other blog post. Well, that creates just a bunch of thin content. It doesn't help the visitor. It, it's overwhelming when you look at a blog post that has 50 tags assigned to it. And it's not helping the user find like content because there is no other like content. And all of those tags are duplicate of each other. So as you're creating those tags, think about what is gonna help the visitor and make sure that those categories and those tags are helping people find like content or you know content of other the same relevancy and that you're making it usable. Again, don't put 50 tags on one blog post because you can't, as a user, try to digest that and look through that list to see what else you might want to click to. You know, and it just, again, creates clutter, creates clutter, it's difficult to read, it's thin content, and it's duplicate content, all of it working against you. Category pages can rank in search. I have one that ranks in search. I've had store category and store tag pages that can rank in search. If you optimize them properly, and you have intro text and you fill out the meta title and the meta descriptions through the Yoast plugin, you can get these to rank. So remember that as you, as you look at them. Don't have the same categories assigned to them as you have for your products or your services. You're competing with yourself. Make sure that they're unique. Take the time to fill out meta titles and descriptions for all of it. That way the search engines will understand what that category is and you'll have something that's pretty and that's enticing that shows up in the search engine results page. Avoid using the categories in your URL structure. I have a client that has done this for years. She's the most wonderful, sweetest person, but she constantly changes her categories and every time she changes her categories, she resets her URL structure, which resets her SEO, which break, breaks a ton of links and incoming referral traffic. My suggestion is don't do it. It just makes things harder for you. It creates a longer URL structure. If you are gonna remove categories and tags, remember to use 301 redirects. Send that traffic over to something that is relevant to it, that is like it, so that you pass that SEO value and you preserve that incoming traffic. <coughs> Whenever you start to add a new category tag, stop and ask yourself, will it be helpful to the human visitor? Do not use these to just um, snake the search engines and to manipulate them it's not going to help always do what's right for the visitor and when you do that that helps you with an SEO with SEO and your strategy all right so the last part of that what that this presentation was my rant because it's things that I constantly see people making mistakes on and and it's just it's people hurting themselves despite their best efforts and I wanted to go through all of those because I see those time and time again I've been doing this for 15 years and I've been a consultant or an agency owner for eight and I've seen it over and over and over again even with the smartest people they do it and then once you kind of go through it with and they go oh that makes so much sense I don't know why I did that to start with that's why I wanted to go through that in my little pet peeve list um, just to kind of help you and preserve you from or you know, stop you from making those same mistakes I've seen people do time and time again. 
So that, that's the content that I wanted to go through. Hopefully we have some good questions that have come up. Um, Nathan, I'm gonna throw it back over to you so you can give me an idea of what people uh, had questions about and what we can chat about. Great, thanks Rebecca. Wow, <coughs> do we have some questions. <laughs> Excellent oh, content today and uh, I don't know how you do it, Rebecca, but you always manage to land the plane right at 15 till. So that's pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> kind of so, like Thanksgiving dinner. I can always make sure all the food comes out hot at the same time, too. That's, I don't right. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, so uh, a question on the, the slide that you just had uh, concerning categories in the URL structure. Uh, I think there's some misunderstanding on isn't that was that what was being suggested in the silo section? Shouldn't you use categories in the head and no, URL structure? So, so the, the silo section, I was talking about pages. I'm glad you asked that, right? <clears throat> so you create the, the hierarchy with pages with parent children. And the reason I don't like to do it with blog posts is because people change categories. And when they do that, they don't realize they're resetting their entire structure, right? And they're resetting those URLs. If you're a very structured person and you're not going to change your categories and you're going to keep them and you're not going to reassign stuff, fine, go ahead and use them. But the average person isn't that structured. They're going to forget that they that they have that. They're going to change the category and then they're going to reset the URL without the, realizing they're even doing it. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's great information. Uh, so Topher had a question or really more of a comment earlier asking, uh, he, he said he'd love to hear more about rel equals canonical. Can you describe that or go into that just a little bit? Oh, Topher, you're killing me. <laughs> no, I can't. Not this one, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> that's, that's more technical and I'm not prepared to discuss that. <laughs> Topher, I still love you though for putting me on the spot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving on down the list, uh, Aditi asked, uh, she says she has a client with a main site and a separate blog, and the client wants an events manager plugin for both sites that eat, uh, so and it's going to be identical content on each of the event managers on each of the sites. Would you discourage indexing on one site? How would you handle that besides, yeah. you know, <laughs> twisting the client's head off? I wouldn't do it. So what I would do is, it, you know, I would... I would either set one to no index so that the search engines are seeing both, or I'm pretty sure that you can get um, RSS feeds from the events plugins so that you could actually take, set the events plugin up on one of the sites and then have it feed over the list of the events to the other one. So you're showing that list, but it's only the list and it's not the actual events. If you do have to have it on both sites and it's their client's adamant about it, you know, you might want to either set one to no index and no follow or create unique descriptions for the events for that site. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, you can do a lot with RSS feeds uh, to deal with duplicate content on multiple sites like that. Great suggestion. Uh, Tatiana had a question right at the beginning about... Uh, do you have any suggestions for an image-heavy site, like for an artist, where there's very little text? Describe your images. So, you know, it, it depends on how you've got your site set up. For sure, make sure that your <clears throat> the image file name, the image, you know, uh, descriptive text, the long description is all unique, is all properly filled out. But then if you can, either use categories for those images so you can create silos with those images and then optimize those silo pages, you know, those parent pages that are listing like images. I don't know if that made sense the way I described it. So, for example, if I have a bunch of images about cats and a bunch of images about dogs, have a page that talks about this is all of your cat images. You can have an intro paragraph and then list the cat pages. Have a page about the dog images, list out all your dog images. That way you are creating silos that way. Good stuff. Um so we had a question earlier and Lawrence just dropped another related question in the chat room about this. Um, Rebecca, can you tell us a little bit about, is it better to do www or non www and how do you handle sometimes when content gets mixed up between the two? How do you deal with that? Just pick one. 
I mean, there's not going to, having it or not having it isn't going to break your site from a usability or an SEO standpoint. The point is to pick one and make sure it's throughout the site. And, you know, if you have the right um, structure to your WordPress and your plugin, it's going to do it for you as long as you just set it and leave it. Great, great. That's more of an issue with non-WordPress sites, by the way. Excellent. Uh, so Ava asked earlier, is a PDF with the same content of a page regarded as duplicate content? Um, well, the search engines will view them probably differently because they understand a PDF as a PDF, right? Um, I guess I would have to, it, 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 technically is a duplicate, yes, although the search engines are smart enough to understand an HTML page versus a PDF. And if it, it, you ask yourself, where do you want people to come? Do you want them to come straight into the PDF? <coughs> or do you want them to come into the page so they hit your website first? And then from the page, request the PDF. And I would assume it's the latter. And if that's the case, optimize for the page. Put the PDF in a directory in your server that is no index, no follow. So the search engines won't actually index that content. And that for that, therefore, the PDF won't hit and be indexed by the search engines. It'll push, the search engines will push everybody to that page, which is what you want because you want them to get them to your site. Awesome. Uh, so let's see here. And folks, we've got so many questions here. I, we're not going to get to all of them, but I'm going to do my very best here. Uh, D asked a question concerning internal links. Is it better to have internal links staying within their own silo or can they cross between silos? Oh, link anywhere that's relevant. I mean, honestly, do not let that, that stop you because the goal is to get users to the information that you need to get them to and links help that happen, right? So cross, <laughs> go anywhere that you need to as long as it helps the visitor. <coughs> Excellent. Um, several <coughs> folks had a question very similar to this one, which is when you're looking at top level navigation, uh, some people say it's better not to have submenus. Some people say it's better to have submenus. Uh, what do you think about that? And is there a limit to how many items should be in a top level menu? So I don't think that there is a universal rule for drop downs or no drop downs. I think it's going to depend on the site and going to depend on the content. If you are going to have children show up in the menu, I wouldn't go any more than um, one or two levels because that becomes overwhelming. If you have a lot of content that's going to show up in the menu, consider using a mega menu that's nicely structured because that definitely helps with usability. Again, think about the user, how easy it is for the user to navigate that and only do what's going to be usable for them and digestible because there's other ways to get people to content if you need to. Great. Uh, Dwayne just asked this question, and I think it's this is a, an important question to get an answer to. Uh, he says that he has a photography website. He tends to strip out the metadata uh, of the images to make the files smaller. Is he hurting his SEO by doing this, by pulling out the metadata? If you, if for your images, you have them within the, if you're, you're in your WordPress, first of all, and you've got the, you've got data, you've got a good name for the file, you have a good description for the image <coughs> inside WordPress, and then you have the long description filled out, you're fine. Because the search engines will use that to be able to figure out what the image is. So focus on that. I totally understand stripping the other stuff out and that's not going to hurt you as long as you have the stuff within the media library filled out. Excellent. Uh, so S men G a asked, so what if you have a corporate site that has like three corporate divisions, is it better to have separate sites for those or to set it up with content silos? Um, I would need to have a lot more information available to be able to help you with that. That, cause that could go either way. You know, um, do they share content? Are they completely different topics? And, you know, uh, do they, do they, do they live completely autonomous from each other? There's so many variables there that, that there's no easy answer. You know, you'd have to dig into what each division does, what kind of information do they have? 
who do they serve? You know, what is their target demographic? Is it completely separate from each other? And then that starts to tell you whether it's a content silo or a subdomain or a separate site. Great. Uh, here's another good one. <coughs> Mateo asked, how, how do you deal with a site that's already established? How can you reorganize it with better content silos without losing ranking? 301 redirects. 301 redirects are your answer to everything. Do not fear restructuring your site as long as you do 301 redirects. Google will pass about 99% of the SEO value with a 301 redirect. You just need to make sure it's in place as you shift the content. Excellent. Uh, Mark asked, uh, if, if he's using categories to structure posts and parent-child relationships to structure pages, where do tags contribute in that whole concept? Um, so I don't use tags for creating parent-children relationships. I create tags to help people find the right content. Um, and, you know, for example, a tag for me on the Web Savvy site is anytime I talk about Google Search Console, that's a tag. So I use that tag and that blog post so people can go, oh, I don't know much about Google Search Console. Let me see what else she said about that. And they can click on that tag and find other blog posts where I've mentioned it and that can give them more information. That's how you should be using tags. Excellent, and Lorraine, that answered your question, I believe, from earlier about how to make <coughs> tags and categories better for the human user. Uh, Tim had a follow-up question that I think is good concerning 301 redirects. Rebecca, how long would you say you need to leave those in place? <coughs> um, I, I generally don't get rid of them, and the reason is because, you know, from a search engine's perspective, you don't need to have them for for a long time you need to have them there for them to get rid of the old content out of the index but the problem is is you have these other websites these other blogs that are linking into your site and if you have an older site the more of this you're going to have right the more links you're going to have if you take away those 301 redirects when those old links from those other sites come pointing into your site they hit a 404 which is a bad user experience and it's going to confuse the search engines. So in that case, I leave the 301 redirects, uh, you know, available where I would get rid of them is if I start to have this daisy chain of 301 redirects that no longer makes sense, then you can start tailoring them down and just link to the final piece of content and get rid of all of the interim um, links. But yeah, there's no, there, for, the, from an SEO standpoint, do not remove them until the search engines have certainly removed out the old content and boosted up the new content. That's that's the minimum. But for the most part, I don't I don't recommend taking them away. Excellent. Um, I think we have time for one more question here, and it's from Erica. Uh, in regard to content silos, uh, you showed the example of the the yoga studio there with the the hierarchy tree graphic that you had. Uh -huh. um, should there be an actual page called Yoga Studios and then the locations under it in, in separate yes. pages? Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's that's a that's another Rebecca pet peeve is when people create content silos and then have a blank parent. So what does that do? That parent is still in the URL structure at any time the search engines or excuse me, the user can cut off the children to go to the parent and they find a dead parent, right? And if you don't do that from a search engine standpoint, you're losing the opportunity to rank for that page. There's no reason not to have that parent and have that parent filled out. Good stuff. Um, <coughs> all right. So, folks, I know there's a lot of questions that we missed in the chat. There was just uh, lots of questions asked today, so I'm sorry about that. I do want to spend the last minute that we have here, though, talking about the SEO Summit that is coming up on uh, next Monday through Wednesday here at iThemes Training, uh, April 24th through 26th, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Time. You'll find the information for that over in the right sidebar beside the chat room at iThemes.com forward slash chat, as well as a $50 off coupon code that is good through Saturday at midnight. It's going to expire Saturday at midnight. So if you've been waiting to the last minute to register for the SEO Summit, we are almost at the last minute. Uh, going to be lots of good content. Rebecca, do you want to talk just a little bit about what's going to happen there at the SEO Summit and why folks should attend? So the SEO Summit is three days, um, three hours each day. It goes through the similar information as my boot camp that's on site, although it has a more condensed approach to it because 
we have less time and we're virtual. Um, I have already been sending out homework. So if you've registered for the summit, you've been getting daily homework assignments from me and you best have those done before you show up on Monday. This is a taskmaster on me, but you'll thank me for doing it. Um, so yeah, so we're going through my SEO process from start to finish. You've got a lot of homework to begin with to kind of prep you and get you thinking towards what I want you to get thinking towards. And then we're going to go through that your homework, which is all about you or the website you're working on or blog you're working on. And we're going to take you through the process with those questions and really get you into, instead of having like these webinars where we're doing bits and pieces, we're doing start to finish. So you can really see where do you start with, what do you work through, and then, you know, what your end product is. And and on Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, you're going to have homework. So please make sure you allow time for that either in the afternoon of your work day or at night. Because if you do the homework, it'll really help you the next day as we're going through the next, you know, the, the next um, lessons. Awesome. And for those of you who are, um, oh, good. So Kristen from iThemes just weighed in in the chat room. For those of you who are saying you haven't gotten your homework yet, uh, she was going to take care of that today. So you guys should get that information today. So that's awesome. Thanks, Kristen, for jumping right in there. Um, so once again, click that link and learn a little bit more about the SEO Summit. And that is coming up next week. That's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of next week, April 24th through 26th. 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Time. Uh, and again, through Saturday midnight, you can use the SEO Summit coupon code that is there in the sidebar uh, for $50 off the registration. And I can't tell you guys how good of a deal this is. Rebecca, isn't the in-person uh, SEO bootcamp something like $2,500? It is, yep, for sure. So you guys are getting the very similar content for a significant discount. So if, uh, if you want to learn more about SEO, this is absolutely the way to do it. I'd encourage you to check that out and uh, make use of this $50 <coughs> off registration coupon code that expires Saturday at midnight. So uh, thanks again, everybody, for investing an hour with us. By the way, if any of you are going to be at WordCamp Raleigh this weekend, be sure to look me up. Both I and Corey Miller, who's the CEO of iThemes, will be there at WordCamp Raleigh, and we would love to meet you. So once again, thanks for spending your time with us today. Hope it was valuable to you. Thanks, Rebecca, for all the great information that you brought today. So let's go out there and apply this information practically and serve our clients skillfully and work on living abundantly. And until next time, we'll see you here on iThemes Training. Have a great week. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.